Hello and welcome to a new Unity tutorial from Infinite Ammo in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. I'm Al Kaloka and today we're going to look at Unity 3.0. We're going to kind of reboot the tutorial series starting by looking at the newest version of Unity and this is actually beta 6 of Unity 3.0. Um, and you can get access to this beta by buying an early copy of Unity 3.0 at the Unity website. That's of course at unity3d.com and it's pretty awesome. There's a lot of really cool new stuff in it and we can take a look at some of those things today. I don't understand everything about the program yet, like about 3.0. I haven't um, explored all the different new features because I don't use all of them in the game that I'm making, but uh, I have experienced some of it and I thought I'd share some of that with you. One of the coolest things, um, even though I can't use many of these things, is, is that um, Unity now supports a whole bunch of different platforms in the same uh, application. Before, you had to get a separate editor to do Unity iPhone projects. But now all that stuff, iPhone, iPod Touch, and iPad is all built in. Um, you can see there's Android support now, so you can build any Android phone device um, or any Android platform. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be on non-phone things at some point. And we have Xbox 360 and PS3 and Wii, which is pretty crazy. Um, of course, you can't just make uh, builds for these things out of the box. You have to actually have a license that you have to purchase to be able to export to these platforms. So, for example, I only have the iPhone, iPod Touch, and iPad, and PC Mac license. I can do web player, but I can't do Android, I can't do Xbox, I can't do PS3, I can't do Wii. Um, the pricing for PC, Mac, and iPhone, and uh, Android stuff is fairly reasonable. The pricing for major consoles is probably going to be way more expensive. It's probably going to be more like an actual engine license cost. So instead of, you know, paying like a, a grand or something, it might be more like uh, 10 grand or 20 grand. I, I have no idea how much it actually costs yet. But that's something to keep in mind. It's not like you just get that kind of stuff for free with Unity. There are a ton of really crazy effects and stuff that you get. One of the craziest built-in things is cloth. Um, here we have, we can just create cloth by going up here. Lots of stuff that you can make in Unity is just in this game object menu. So if we hit this up, you see there's a whole bunch of stuff here that we can create. Um, particle systems, cameras, 3D text, we've got lights, we've got all these different types of uh, primitives. Unfortunately we don't have a lot of flexibility in the primitives, like you can make a cube, um, but to actually make an interesting level you need to build your own primitive prefabs, like things like angled slopes and stuff like that, you're not going to get that in here. Um, also, Unity's default plane isn't really good for doing 2D stuff because it's got like a, a million quads on it. Uh, it's got like a ton of triangles. So you're going to want to make your own custom planes uh, for doing 2D stuff. We can talk more about that later. Cloth is really neat because you just drop it in and then it, it just acts like cloth. Um, and it sometimes just bugs the hell out like this. <laughs> Um, using cloth is interesting. I've been trying to use it for gameplay and it's really hard to get it to do anything predictable. Um, it's a really cool effect, but I, I think right now it's not at the stage where you would actually be able to make fun gameplay with it unless your entire game was about cloth and you rolled with all the sort of problems that it has um, because it can do some weird things sometimes. Um, one of the neat things about cloth is you can attach it two things so it, it right now we're just creating cloth that's not hanging from anything so it'll just sort of fall down and crumple and, and do all that weird stuff um, if we create what I'm doing right now is that I'm uh, hitting I'm on a Mac so I'm using command D to duplicate objects on Windows it would be control D so you'd select an object I'm in the selection mode up here you can see um, there are different modes for manipulating the scene. Uh, the, the hand lets you move around. This guy lets you select and move things. This guy lets you rotate things. This guy lets you scale things. And there's hotkeys for these. Q, W, E, R. And those are super handy for getting things done quickly because you don't want to keep going up there and clicking and moving back. 
you just want to hit the hotkeys and move stuff around. So Command D or Control D duplicates, which lets you move a lot faster than having to go back up to this menu to make a new thing. Um, and it also lets you position things a lot easier because you know where you're starting from. So for example, what I'm trying to do is create a cube at the top of this cloth. And to do that, the easiest way is to duplicate it. And then I know I move straight up. And I'm also holding Command while I'm dragging. And on Windows, that would be Control again. And that locks to grid. So I can move stuff around, lock to a grid, which makes it a lot easier to position things evenly. You can scale on a grid by holding Command or Control while you scale. Notice I'm dragging from the handles in the axis that I want to move stuff around in. Also, I'm holding Alt and left click dragging to rotate, which is very handy. Another valuable shortcut key is after you select something, you can hit F and you'll zoom in on the object. You'll, the camera will pan over and focus on the object so you can get a good handle on where it is. And these things over here help you orient the scene. So if you want to look at it from just a side-on perspective, you can rotate around until you find that. Pushing in the center sometimes changes the perspective as well. So what I'm trying to do is just make this thing in the center here. My cloth is not centered, so I'm going to go over here. Now, when we select an object, the inspector window here changes to show us information about the object in the scene. So this is something that you're going to get really used to. You're going to get really used to clicking on things in the hierarchy or clicking on things in the scene and then going over to the right here and looking at stuff. Also, I've customized my layout. And you can see there's, there's a bunch of different layouts um, here. I think I'm using the 2x3 layout. Yes. And this is the one I find the most useful. It, it means that there's two things over here and three things over here. You have your scene view where you can actually look at what's in your level and you have a game view which shows you what the camera is looking at. So if I move the camera around, you'll see the game view changes. And this is really handy. You can see what the game's going to look like when you run it. And of course we have our play, pause, and step buttons here. And play will, of course, run the game. And you can see it acting out both in the scene and in the game view. And one of the coolest things about Unity is you can actually move stuff around while the game is playing. So if you want to test out something, you can actually, I can actually try to uh, bash this cloth around using a block while the game is running. And this is super, super useful for debugging anything and, and just testing out how features in, in the engine work because you can kind of just play around with it and see what happens when you do things. And then later write code if you uh, do something that you like and you want to repeat it in the actual game. So that's kind of neat. Um, but back to the inspector here, we have the interactive cloth selected. And you can see there's, there's a bunch of stuff over here. Um, we have a bunch of information about the game object. Now, everything in Unity is a game object. Every single object in your scene is a game object. It's also a bunch of other things. It also has a transform on it. And a transform is, is something that um, basically positions your object in space uh, also gives it a rotation and gives it a scale. Now, most objects have um, a transform, uh, but it's not. Yeah, actually, it is required, I believe. Everything needs to exist in space somewhere. Also, this little help button is really useful. Um, you can click it um, next to various different components. These are actually called components, by the way. And you hit this little help button, it'll bring up information in your browser about what that component does. So we can actually read all about the transform component if we want. And we can read all about the interactive cloth component if we want. And we can get information about, oh, how does this actually work? And what do all the values actually do? And that's super, super useful. You can also highlight over these. It'll give you um, some information. Uh, it's more like a shortcut. It doesn't actually give you a detailed explanation. And help is better for that. So whenever you're sort of learning stuff in Unity, one of the best things to do is just check out the help for the component that you're messing around with, and you'll probably be able to find out why something is not behaving the way that you thought it would. So cloth is one of the new things that we have, and we can actually have it attached to things. So if it's touching a collider, and um, if something is outlined in green, it means it has a collider on it. So this cube that we've created, we went up here and we went to create a new cube. Um, has a green outline around it because it has a collider component on it. Oh, look, there's the component. 
Uh, it's called the box collider. And we can attach stuff to the cloth. Here we're just going to go down into this attach colliders thing. We pulled this open and we have a size parameter that we can change and basically we're going to set it to one because we want one thing in our list. This is like a list of stuff and setting the size lets us change how many things we have in it. Um, and we're going to just drag a collider in here. We're going to drag this cube and see what happens. And lo and behold, the cloth sticks to this thing. So that's pretty neat. You can make uh, curtains this way. And there's a whole bunch of other really neat parameters you can play around with. You can have it so the cloth can actually get ripped off of the uh, thing that it's attached to. And you can attach the cloth to any side. It doesn't have to be the top, for example. So if we rescale this a bit, um, move this over here. Let's see what happens. Yeah, so now we've got something that's a bit more like a flag. We could kind of drag this around, and of course it's terrible, so we, since we pulled it too hard, the cloth ripped off. So let's like make it not terrible for a second. Um, this looks a bit more like a flag, a really weird flag. Uh, and one of the most annoying things about physics engines is that it's really, really hard to get them to look like something actually good. Um, a lot of time they have behavior that appears more random than than you'd predict. So for example, you hear something like, oh, cloth, that sounds cool. It sounds like I can use it just like a cloth. Well, not really. Um, you have to be very careful about how you use it in an actual game um, because it might do really, really freaky things. And generally, it's really hard to build gameplay around physics systems. Um, they're very unpredictable, and generally gameplay stuff, you want to be predictable for the player. You want the player to push a button and know what they're going to do, uh, know, what, know what their character in the game is going to do when the button is pressed. So if a million different things can happen when the button is pressed, then that sort of changes the nature of your game. Um, usually in a bad way, although some games are based purely around physics and the idea that you're experimenting with a really weird complicated system and, and that can work too. So that's sort of cloth and um, there's a lot more you can do with it but I'm not going to go too much further into that today. We're going to look at some other stuff and again this tutorial we're basically mixing um, looking at some new Unity 3.0 features as well as just reintroducing you to all the concepts of Unity in case you've been away or in case you haven't looked at it before. So how do we actually make stuff move in a game? Say we wanted this little cube guy to be a character that moved around. Um, well, there's, a f there's at least two main different ways of doing this. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a minute.